Now, most of his life, always a traveler, but Harlem would become home. Lightson Hughes is notable for uh, those of us who study African American literature because he was one of the persons who, in the 1920s, insisted upon making use of vernacular patterns of speech among African Americans as a source of literary creation. At a time in American literature when there was a genuine search for what one might call an American voice, um, Lightson Hughes, along with Zora Neale Hurston and Sterling Brown, believed that um, African Americans didn't have to look very far for that voice. The voice was there. The big question was how one would rest away from the popular culture uh, the blackface minstrelsy that had an inauthentic voice of African Americans and replace that with the authentic voice of African Americans. So Langston Hughes, in his quest for that authentic voice, introduced to American poetry something that we now call jazz poetry and blues poetry. Uh, largely making use of the blues form, uh, you know, three lines in which you have uh, the opening uh, line and that line is repeated and then a resolution in the third line. The distinction between the first line and the second line, of course, is a tonal one. Not often is there a change of actual words, uh, but a tonal difference sets up the sort of dialectic that is resolved in the third line. Well, he would bring this to poetry, and I think one of his most successful um, first publications was a collection called Weary Blues. Um, he was noted also as the peacemaker among African American writers in the 1920s. It was a strange time the 1920s, the great jazz age. Um, American popular culture had uh, uh, sort of snatched uh, African American music and uh, ran with it. Um, and uh, Langston was sort of concerned that something was being taken away from African Americans not that it was to be shared with the rest of the world uh, was a bad thing. He thought that was good. But what he wanted shared with the rest of the world was the authentic voice and not the um, sort of um, satire or satirizing uh, of um, African-American life. So he found himself engaged not only in poetry writing, uh, playwriting, uh, novel writing, but he created characters that would be suitable to run in a column in the newspaper. One of those characters he created to carry this sort of authentic voice was a character called Simple, Jess B. Simple. He spelled it J-E-S-S, -S, capital B, period. The B didn't stand for anything, <laughs> but just be simple. And that somehow, the very name of this character, seemed to carry with it the message that um, uh, Langston Hughes had in mind. But there was no reason, really, for the African-American writer to try to sound as if he were English, that is, British. Um, that there was an American tenor, uh, and that if you know, one could find it, that would be great. Now, among Langston Hughes's heroes already was the likes of Mark Twain, that had really sort of introduced the vernacular into American literature, that authentic voice of Americans. And one of his contemporaries, of course, was Ernest Hemingway. Um, and he uh, uh, saw what they were doing 
and thought that he could go one better. In addition to the clamor about a genuine American voice, whether it was African American or just general American, there was in the black community a great deal of concern about who represented the Negro, as it was called in those days. That was a serious question, because on the American scene at that time were a number of African Americans who had been born in the Northeast, uh, many of whom could claim that their uh, forebearers had been freed from slavery over 100 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. And that because they lived in the likes of New England, they had been exposed to what they called primary democracy. That meant they lived in a community where they were given a voice. They had a voice in the body politic of their hometowns. And when they were, like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, extremely talented, the church came forward and provided uh, scholarships for them to go to school. In Du Bois' case, it was the Congregationalist Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, a community that was very much um, uh, acquainted with Du Bois' family for century, for at least a century. And when Du Bois turns up in the community, a very bright um, young man, uh, the people who were, ran the uh, factories, um, owned the factory in town, um, that hired the people, uh, but did not hire blacks, but did hire the, the common people in the, the community. Nonetheless, through the church, the factory provided uh, funding for Du Bois. Du Bois had a fabulous classical education and spent a time in, um, uh, at Fisk University um, in Nashville, Tennessee, and then from there back uh, east to Harvard and then to University of Berlin. Now, that was the case of W.E.B. Du Bois, but there were at least 10 other people in the Harlem uh, Renaissance period of the 1920s who could boast the same kind of educational background. These people were referred to as the Talented Tenth. These were people who talked about what the Negro needed at that time was a good classical education um, uh, rather than the vocational education that was being offered by the likes of Booker T. Washington in Alabama. At the same time, there were those people who were concerned about the literature of African Americans. I mean, um, should they simply imitate the literature around them, or should they seek to create a literature out of their own uh, sort of cultural moorings? Well, in the process of trying to discover which would be best, there was a battle between the intelligentsia and the likes of Langston Hughes and Zora Noel Hurston and Sterling Brown. These three people believed that if there was to be an authentic voice of African Americans, an authentic African American literature, it had to come out of the people. It could not be something imposed by a classical education. That is to say, classical education was fine, but the primary place to begin was with that authentic voice. If the authentic voice raised in literature could do the same thing for African-American literature as the authentic voice that was raised in song had done for the hymn and the spiritual, then it was worth a try. Langston Hughes was one of the foremost leaders in this quest for the authentic voice. I have chosen to read today from one of his most popular characters, and we can call him a vernacular character. <clears throat> Just be simple is, as his name implies, um, um, a, a simple common man. He is a man who cannot boast of uh, uh, an education per se. 
uh, he has been educated on the streets of Harlem, uh, having come from a uh, good old state of Virginia. Uh, he came to Harlem and he never went back south anymore. Jess has been married uh, a couple of times. He is now, at the time of uh, these writings, um, married to his wife, Joyce. Joyce is uh, a no-nonsense woman, um, and he married her because she insisted upon keeping a budget. Uh, his first uh, wife was very much concerned in buy me this, and so he was buying her this, and he was buying her that, and buying her this, and that, and the other, and they never had anything but those things that she sort of surrounded herself with as absolute necessities for making it in the world of Harlem, the great jazz age. Then, uh, through uh, some misfortune, uh, uh, Jess got a divorce and found Joyce. And now Joyce is so tight on the budget that uh, Jess finds himself with a few pennies in his pocket, and he can go on occasion to the bar at the corner, and he can sit there at the bar, and he can have his one beer, which he nurses and nurses and nurses <laughs> until the froth bubbles away. <laughs> and then he turns to the other patrons, and he gets himself geared for a story of sorts, and he sort of leans over and looks at his beer, of course, his glass is empty, and that's the clear signal to his um, audience that somebody ought to come up pretty soon with a glass of beer so he can get on with the story. Well, this Just Be Simple has a story about everything and anything. And so <clears throat> we are going to listen here to one of his stories um, called Bomb Shelters. It is wise to keep one eye open, said Simple, even when you are asleep. <laughs> to what are you referring now, I asked, leaning on the bar as Simple gazed with a hint my way at his empty glass. The trickerization going on in the world, said Simple. What trickerization, I inquired. Adam bomb shelters, said Simple. Our landlord last week came talking to me about he was going to have to raise the rent in order to build a bomb shelter in the backyard. Now, you know, Harlem landlords have no intention of building no bomb shelters for their rumors. With 50, 11 dozen people living in each and every rooming house, even if the law required it, how could landlords build enough shelters for every rumor? And if rumors built their own shelters, me and Joyce, living in a kitchenette, for instance, Suppose we built a bomb shelter in the landlord's backyard. How would we keep the other rumors out in case of a raid? Then people on the ground floor would beat us to our shelter before we could get downstairs. And they have an ageable grandmother in their family downstairs. Now, what kind of a gentleman would I be if I said, Grandma, you can't go in my shelter. How would I sound saying to an old woman, if you come in, I have to stay out. This mail order shelter I got is only assembled for my wife and me. How would that sound? But them mail order shelters is only big enough for two. Of course, I could always put it up to Joyce, who tells me I must be a gentleman, come what may. 
with the Adam Sarin sounding, standing at the door of my shelter, I would say, Joyce, you are my wife. Does you wish me or grandma to accompany you inside this shelter? Uh, should I give way to a nice old lady and stand outside and meet my death or go underground with you and leave somebody else's grandma out? You've told me in the past, ladies first, be a gentleman. Uh, what do you say now, Joyce? Of course, Joyce might be real noble and say age before beauty. Then I would say, Joyce, I know you do not mean that I should go in. Whereupon Joyce would say, this is no time for joking, simple. <laughs> so I would say, I will be a gentleman then, Joyce, and let Grandma go down in the shelter with you, although she is no relation to us. I can just see Joyce turning as pale as her complexion will permit, at the thought of losing me, burnt to an atom outside the door. But by then, Grandma would take my arm and say, Son, you know, I cannot go into that shelter without my grandchildren, Martha, May, Ellen, Johnny Baby there. Sure enough. <laughs> If I look back, there would stand all of them little ones in Grandma's family, scared as they could be, out there in the middle of the night at the door of my bomb, Adam Bomb Shelter, clutching onto Grandma. Behind them would stand also their mother and father. Then one of them young ones would start crying. I don't want to go in the cave without my grandma and my mama. And I would say, this shelter is built for two, honey. Your grandma, three children, and your mama makes five, not counting my wife, Joyce. <laughs> Who can figure that out? Whereupon, the big old Negro, what? fathered all of them children, but neglected to build them a shelter, would say, don't nobody count Papa? And I would yell, no, I don't count Papa. Before I would let you in my shelter, I will fight you. You have seen me in the corner bar 99 times, and you have not treated me to a single beer yet. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to make, do you want to make something out of it? He would say, bubbling up his fist. I'll fight you barehanded, I would say. But Joyce would scream, just simple, with death staring you in the face. Would you want to make a commotion? I do, I would say, taking off my coat. I'll fight him right here now. But just at that moment, Believe it or not, the old clear signal would sound, mm -hmm. the sirens would stop, and the radios would start blaring, danger is past, danger is past. The warning must have been a false alarm. Grandma and that family downstairs would all go trooping back into the house. Joyce would throw her arms around my neck and say, thank God you're saved, just simple. <laughs> but. Let's tear down that shelter tomorrow. I cannot go in there and leave them children and grandma outside. Neither could I leave you outside, baby, just darling, my life. Nor could I leave you, I would say, hugging her into my arms as close as white on rice. So let's just tear our shelter down, Joyce would say. If the bum does come, let's all die neighborly. <laughs> then Joyce and me would go back in the house, our problem solved. Anyhow, we could not go in that shelter and leave Grandma outside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Jess has opinions about everything. And one gets a distinct sense that he hangs around the bar and collects uh, another beer for another story. And sometimes I can imagine in the middle of a story, he has to have something to wet his whistle so he's not hoarse like <laughs> <laughs> I seem to be getting. <coughs> um, and someone brought water for me to wet my whistle. <laughs> what a difference. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> as you may gather from uh, Jess's language, she's not always grammatical. But he never fails to make good sense. And so we forgive him the trespasses he makes on the King's English or the Queen's English. Um, and we try to look a little deeper at some of his thoughts. <coughs> the next piece is called Gospel Singers. <clears throat> it looks, said Simple, like the churches are buying up half the old movie theaters in Harlem and turning them into temples. Lenox Avenue, 7th Avenue, Amsterdam, all up and down. It's getting so you can't tell a theater from a church anymore. <laughs> now the ministers have got their names all up in lights out front, just like movie actors. Have you noticed? I have, I said. I guess television is driving neighborhood movie houses out of business. Yes, so simple, and the churches are taken over. The church will be here when the movies are gone, that's sure thing. But old time storefront churches are going out of style. From now on, it looks like you have to call them movie front churches, except that the box office has turned into a collection plate. And the choir is swinging gospel songs. Money is being made just one collection after another. You're not supposed, you, you, I'm sorry, I suppose that you're not opposed to churches taking up collections, are you simple? Like, like other institutions. They, they have to pay the rent, the light, the heat, plus the minister's fees. I'm not opposed, said Simple. Not when they put on a good show. Show, Simple. And a show is hardly a word to use in reference to religion. Uh, do you think so? Well, Simple says, that's the way some churches advertise their gospel singers these days. I see the poster outside a church last night, Sister Mamie Lightfoot and her gospel show, and they were charging one dollar to come in. Also, programs cost a quarter, and you had to have one to get past the door. <laughs> did you go in? I said, All right, I did, and it was fine. Four large ladies in sky blue robes sung on my journey now sung it and swung it and real gone with a jazz piano behind it that sounded like a cross between Dorothy Donegan and Count Basie. Them four sisters started slow. Then they worked it up and they worked it up and they worked it up until they came on like gangbusters led by Sister Lightfoot. Then they started walking up and down the aisles from the pulpit to the rear, making out like they were really on their journey to the promised land. And the church all fell in. They did the last part over 17 times. While folks jumped up, they leaped, they hollered, they shouted, and started marching too. Then they took up collection. They took up a collection for the benefit of Sister Lightfoot. The plates were overflowing. I put in a dollar myself. You mean after you paid a dollar to get in the door? Uh, I 
were so moved, I, I did not mind contributing again, Simple said. Besides, there was a young Negro, uh, young Negro there named McKissick who rocked the rafters. That boy can stone sing a song. To tell the truth, gospel singers these days put on, put more into their songs than a lot of nightclub stars hanging onto a microphone looking like they're on their last legs. <laughs> Besides, you could hear a gospel single two blocks away, singing and swinging, even without a microphone. In the past, I've heard Mahalia, the Ward singers, Sally Martin, Princess Stewart, Elder Beck, James Cleveland, the Dixie Hummingbirds, the Davis Sisters, and also the Martin Singers. And I'm telling you, the music that these people put down cannot be beat. It moves the spirit and it moves the feet. It's gone, man, solid gone. Which is why I has no objections to pitting at the door and then shelling out some more when I get inside even if they do invest most of it in automobiles. <laughs> as good as them gospel people sing, why should they not ride on rubber or any, uh, or of any kind they want, from Cadillacs to Jaguars? Why, I saw a quartet of five come driving up to a church in Harlem once, and each one of them singers in the quartet was driving a different kind of car and each car were fine. Them five boys got out of them five fine cars and went into the church and started singing, if I can make it, if I can just make it in, meaning into the kingdom. They also sung, I cannot get there by myself. And everybody said, help them, Jesus, help them. Which the congregation did by contributing a dollar or a dollar and a half. <laughs> Them boys took home a bushel of money. Another song I like is Move On Up A Little Higher. Also, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Don't you? Don't you like that? Some of them large colored sisters can really sing such songs. We have some great gospel singers in this land. They are working in the vineyards of the Lord and digging into his gold mines. Why, some gospel singers these days are making so much money that when you hear them crying, I can't bear my burden along, what they really mean is, help me get my cross to my Cadillac. <laughs> Which is okay by me, as long as they keep on singing like they do. Good singers deserve their just rewards, both in this world and in the other. Yes, they do. Now, are you really a gospel aficionado? I said. Well, whatever that means, I do like gospel. But take my wife, Joyce. She's not too much moved by it, although she appreciates my yet. Joyce goes for opera, which sounds like squalls and squawks to me. What operas, I ask. Oh, any opera, said Simple. But what I'm meaning now is them that Joyce listens to on the radio. My wife is the most opera-listening woman I know. Me, I don't care for it much. Uh, probably uh, you do care for it because you don't understand opera, I said. Well, they, they's all in it Italian, said Simple. And Joyce do not understand Italian either. Yet she loves opera. Your wife appreciates the music, I said. And she probably takes time and the trouble to read the story of Carmen and Tosca and Aida and what not? Culture may not always be appreciated without preparation. Perhaps if you were to read the libretto of an opera and know its story, you would understand it better. But, said Simple, what I want to know is, why is all them operas in Italian? They're not all in Italian, I said. Wagner's operas are in German. 
and he said uh, in French, Zorkis, in Russian, and Mineto in English, I said, even when operas are in English, simple sense, they sound like they were in Italian. <laughs> Once I went with Joyce to Carnegie Hall to hear a colored opera presented by Madame Dawson and written by a famous colored composer, and it sounded to me like they were all sung in Yiddish. <laughs> all the singers were colored. The program said the opera were uh, the opera were in English, so I know it was not in Italian. But if you'd have heard. Uh, if you've ever pushed a cart like me down in the garment district with Jewish people, you've heard Yiddish. You know it is a language you cannot understand. Since I cannot understand this opera, I asked Joyce, did she reckon all of them colored singers had Jewish singing teachers? <laughs> Joyce said, shh, why would you ask such an absurd question? I said, because I don't understand a word. Joyce said, but the tone the projection. Do you not hear that bel canto? I said, hell no, my canto. Oh, which made Joyce mad, oh. She began to tell me that she did not see why I had to come show my ignorance right there in Carnegie Hall. She said I should not be talking to an aria anyway and that Madame Dawson had put on a fine production. I said, everybody should look sure looks fine down there on the stage, most particularly that chick right over there with that low-cut gown with the brooch over her navel. She looks sharp. <laughs> she is singing flat, Joyce said, and she's the least good in the company. I had rather look at her than that big fat lady over there singing Great Google Moogle, I said. She's not singing Great Google Moogle, cried Joyce. She is chanting Great God of Mercy, <laughs> crying to the voodoo god to save her lover from death. I'm glad you told me what it was about, I said. But by the time Joyce, but by that time Joyce had turned her back as far as she could on me. In them seats, we had just paid five dollars and fifty cents per each, just to come here to hear that opera. Joyce, were listening fluently. Maybe she too enjoy that kind of music, but me, I don't understand it. I prefer his gospel. Now, I said, just because you don't understand the thing. Do not make fun of it too harshly, or be too critical of others liking it. Tastes differ. You go in for beer, some go for Bach, some go for Goldoni, and some for gospel. As for opera, thousands of people like it. You don't happen to be in that number. Yet, if I remember correctly, when Marian Anderson first sang at the Metropolitan Opera, you were one of those cheering the loudest right here in this bar. Right, said Simple, right here in this bar, not up there at the opera. Bravo, Marian, sing, woman, sing. Bartender set up me a beer. And now that Marian Anderson has retired and put opera and concerts down, I hope she takes up the gospel. Could make a million dollars as a gospel singer. Don't be ridiculous, simple. Well, when was money ever ridiculous? Said simple. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, read one more from Mr. Hughes and. Uh, Roots and Trees. <clears throat> A 
My wife is an intellect, said Simple. And that club she belongs to is always pursuing culture. Nothing wrong, except that it takes so much time. Joyce was sitting up in the library all last Saturday, reading up on the old problem of how to solve the problem of you can't take a Negro out of the country. Uh, you can take a Negro out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the Negro, which I say is a lie. Harlem has certainly taken the country out of me. When I first came to the Big Apple, I didn't know beans from bullfoot. But look at me today. I'm hip, I'm slick, I'm cool, and I'm no fool. You managed to hold your own in New York, I said. A foothold is all I need, said Simple, and my hands can hang on. I've been hanging on in New York for a right smart while, and tend to stay. I will not return to the country, north or south, backwoods, not for me. I am a big city man myself. My roots is here. In other words, you are urbanized. That's the word I heard Joyce use, said Simple. What her club is studying is how to make the unurbanized Negro do right and stop throwing garbage out the window, sweeping trash into the street, fussing on the stoops and cussing on the corner. Joyce says her club is making that a project. To which I said, Joyce, I think you all have got yourselves bit off more than your ladies club can chew. To which Joyce answers, well, you men's are doing nothing. What club do you belong to, just be simple, that is trying to remedy the disgraceful conditions of adult delinquency here in Harlem? I am not talking about children, but grown delinquent men. I said, baby, do not look at me in that tone of voice. You know I carries myself right, uh, drunk or sober. Uh, to which Joyce says, to act right yourself is not enough. You must also help others to act right. We are all brother, our brother's keepers and cousins too. I know Joyce was referring to my cousin Minnie, who sometimes do not act like a lady. But I ignored Joyce's remark. I said, darling, you know I belong to the NAACP, and I would join the Elks if my budget would let me. Mm -hmm. Our club, said Joyce, is an auxiliary of the Urban League, and our president, Mrs. Sadie Maxwell Reeves, is an officer in the Harlem branch of the League which has done much to help transpose the rural Negro to big city ways, the southern customs to northern manners. Then that is where I should send my cousin Minnie, I says, to your club to see if you all can't take some of that down-home loudness out of her mouth. Minnie would be right nice woman if she weren't so loud. Minnie also needs a job adjustment, said Joyce. A job, period, I says. But the kind of job where she doesn't have to go in on time. Well, there's no such job in the urban community, said Joyce. In the city, folks work by clocks, not by how they feel when they get up in the morning. <laughs> that I learned early, I agreed. Before I married you and sobered up, Joyce, I learned to go to work on time. Hangover or no hangover, else be fired. Northern white folks is harder on the late Negro than they are down south. That, Joyce says, is because the whole south runs late. <laughs> but up here in the free north, a man ain't free to be late, I said, cutting her off. But once Joyce latches onto a subject, there's no cutting her off. Mm -hmm. Just be, I want you to help me form a block club. 
A what? I says. A club to keep this block clean. Baby, I said. It would take more than a club to keep this block clean. It would take an artillery, tanks, and state militia. I'm not joking, said Joyce. Just theory and no action gets society nowhere. <laughs> So Ms. Maxwell Rees said in her talk at the All-State Women's Convention last month, where she were the only colored woman to appear at the wind up session. The message she brought back to us here in Harlem was action and more action. Just simple, we women are marching into action and you men are going to help us. Just baby, I knew. I had better ask, what do you want me to do? Help us take away this country, the, their country ways, and prepare them for big city days. In plain words, I say, to live in the city, to get with the nitty gritty, wise up and be witty. Joyce did not even smile. All she said was, just don't be silly. So. I pulled a long face, too. Now, you know, I got to try to do what Joyce wants me to do. The next thing you know, Joyce will be the president of our block club. And I am going to help her. Amen, I said. Joyce says Harlem has got to let down our roots where we are, said Simple, and let our trees grow tall. I wonder where is the tallest tree in the world anyway? I have seen some pretty tall trees among the redwoods in California, I said, and some very tall palms in Africa. But there has to be some tree on earth somewhere that is taller than any other tree anywhere, said Simple. Maybe just a tiny smidgen taller, say a quarter of an inch, or maybe only an eighth of an inch, but a little tiny bit extra of a fraction of an inch would make it the tallest tree, taller than any other tree in the world. And it could be proud. I wonder where that tree is. Probably in Africa. And if so, the black race can be proud of having the tallest tree in the world. Nonsense, I said. How can any race be proud of something it did not create? You know that song that so many singers moo and croon and brawl over about only God can make a tree? How can a man be proud of a tree that just grew? Well, at least he did not cut it down, said Simple. Say, what do you think uh, it would be like uh, to be married to the tallest woman in the world? <laughs> a little short woman is hard enough to keep a harness on. And even a medium-sized woman, my, my wife Joyce, I'm sometimes afraid to tackle. But the tallest woman in the world, unless she was married to one of those globetrotters, would be something for a man to handle. It is funny how God lets some folks grow so tall like Will Chamberlain and others grow so short like Sammy Davis, and me so in between with neither shortness nor tallness. Nobody makes admiration over me no kind of way except my wife sharp-tempered as she can be sometimes. There is other times when Joyce says to me, baby, you are the sweetest man on earth. And she looks at me with them sweet, wonderful, admiring eyes of hers. Then I feel like the tallest tree in the world. That tree that is maybe just one little eighth of an inch taller than any other tree anywhere else in the world. Me, I am that tree. Oh, my friend, the power of a sweet, kind word to keep you tall. <laughs> This was 
an interesting experience <clears throat> to take the separate pieces and then organize them in a way that uh, they would tell a story. And I've used the um, titles of the paintings um, and drawings uh, as titles of the poems. Um, <clears throat> the first uh, dreamer um, is now proudly owned by Lorette Mast. I mean, she saw it, walked in the door, I want it, <laughs> that one. Um, it's a fabulous piece. Um, the way that the uh, book is organized, uh, uh, Dreamer proposes to be something of the uh, uh, narrator uh, here, or at least he entices um, uh, other people to tell their stories, uh, part of their dreams. Um, I uh, want to add here that uh, this was a collaborative effort only in that um, um, I was allowed to use the paintings and to organize them in the way that I have. Um, uh, uh, Sherry Davis is in no way responsible for the ideas in the poems. I mean, this is strictly my reaction uh, uh, to the to the to the paintings. Um, so let me read Dreamer, and then I will read the one that uh, met with so much favor in Romania. Dreamer. I, Dreamer, stand accused of everything imaginable. Name it and I, dream maker, made or can or will make it. I'm a neural technician, say a tinkerer of sorts. I do as the body tells me, do. The whole body remembers. The whole body sheds memory like flakes of dead skin. Let me weave the web of these dreams. Reasons to dream. This tortured figure dances in flashing light on the reverse side of a negative, where there is no white space etched into the darkness. Rhythm is a stream of contorted rage. Despair nests in his sagging loins. Were it for love that he danced, the whir of his moment, movement would whisper. The names of all sins would go unspoken. His raised arms would teach the art of knitting kinship among the fragments memory nurses through the miracle of dreams. He, being gracious, would direct safe passage to tomorrow. But love is unreal. Dreams paralyze his opened eye. He is the watchman. Safety has no sanctuary in the dark. Now I know I said that I would read really two points. If you have a minute, just let me wander through, okay? Uh, she never had made waves. The string of pearls around her neck have oyster shells between. She breathes on the shells. Her breath is an ocean. The ocean is a spoon of brine over shells. The last words she speaks before turning before she turns to stone. I was a good little girl and an obedient woman. Now, I would have you look at the, the piece here. Little girl, downcast eyes, flower in her hand, sitting between the legs of her father or a male figure here. It's very interesting 
how I started picking up a story um, in the works, and it's it's my story. It's not Sherry's. It's mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that to spare uh, Sherry the repercussions of what was going on in my mind, because they were certainly not in her mind. Um, but this became a key to how I interpreted the rest of things. As you look at the other pictures, note in the very next one, was she ever really happy? Here is the child now as a grown woman. Some of the same characteristics. Here, the necklace is around her neck. She is carrying a flower. All right. Now, I did not make that continuity up. That's a vision. I mean, it's it's here. So we're left to believe that that is a possibility. Okay. And I think I was concerned with my own experience growing up, sort of essentially being in the company of, of women, um, I, I guess I didn't know another place to be. I mean, there were no real alternatives. But to sense the kinds of agonies which they never talked about, they always seem to be absorbing and absorbing and absorbing pain. And I didn't know how to express that. I mean, I could feel it, but I, I had no text as a reference. What Sherry's work allowed me to do as I found myself moving into this world of women was to find a text that made it possible for me to review some of the um, some of my early experiences being conscious of the pain of women. And I make this confession, I think it's the first time I, I, I dared say it, but I mean, it, it seemed to be a necessity um, uh, at this point. But um, it's interesting how, even as I read these poems over again, there's an intense feeling of association. I am, in fact, speaking a woman's voice, speaking a woman's pain. And for me, it was quite an achievement. Um, and if you read the poetry carefully, you will find there is a story of pain, really very deep pain. And um, I've sort of handle that with a mature voice of, well, let's say, I should say, the voice of a um, mature um, woman. Um, uh, and this is called, um, let me see. It, it, it's called Untitled, Portrait of a Woman, page 47. One of Shakespeare's lovely dark lovers says, indiscretions are memorable little wounds. They enter in dreams as bulbous, as tainted lilies, and strain to catch the mute eloquence of a conjured sunrise. Or I can imagine it. I have known a few indiscretions in life and in dreams. They are as cute as a cunning child. How well they make up their mind just before the fact. Like they've calculated the damages and matched a range of likely causes to choose one after another bites the dust. When I am on a roll, that keeps me going from any one discreetly towards infinity. Imagine. Surely you're not wanting a confession. I'm done already. I'm safe for a spell. Unless there is another of those episodes of forgetfulness. 
I should then garner something from memory and self-defense. Can't say yet what it would be. If I dream as I nod at these days, I do not remember it. I do not sleep nights. It's a nuisance. Watchman catches at my breath, then tosses my body like a rag doll's. Why bother? Well, today may not be as good as yesterday or tomorrow, but it's the best I can do on short notice. Thank you all very much. I just don't want to take up more of your time. I love doing it. So. I have to. I have to leave. Now, if you have to go, is one that was really um, a hit in Romania. Um, I went to Romania about three years ago for the first time to do a um, performance art piece at the American Cultural Center. And um, at the time I was working on this and was working also on a video which I read the poems and have the images. So I shared the images on the video and read the poems to the people gathered there. And then after that, I did um, an improvisational um, calligraphic um, uh, bit to, uh, to jazz. Blue Gloves was one of the favorites. Um, and the other one was, I think, Red Run. Blue Gloves. I wear the blue gloves to gather fragments of myself that fly loose like moths in a cloister. Otherwise, I am naked, as erect as royalty, everything prearranged, paid for in advance. I haven't the option of dance cards filled with the names of farm boys whose innocence I could tease with chocolate sweets. I'm stuck to what came with the first light, abstraction, <clears throat> the way of life. It is my state of outcast, my legacy. Who am I to question the way things are now from the beginning? Fragments of resistance ignite in clusters at midriff fly across the screens I see at boundaries in my dreams. Everything else of myself is precisely fixed, stayed as a photograph of forgetfulness. When I was a child at my father's knee, I spoke as a child filled with my mother's horror of this world. A festival for the good, I poked the eyes out of spontaneity to recite the nimble precepts someone else offered in class palms, one eye shifting to where no one else was listening. Uh, as a woman, uh, as I am a woman now, I see horrors of my own set apart. I am a woman never having been a child of my own. I wear the blue gloves to gather fragments of myself that fly loose. My hands are still clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sir? Yes, ma'am. What kind of discussion did you have with the Romanians when you read? Um, there was a woman who asked me if it were possible that I really understood what the Romanian woman went through before the period of the communists. Um, that they were in a position of serfdom, in a way. They were ruled by tyrants, and they were also ruled by a government that didn't really care. But then, at home, they were ruled by husbands who had distinct 
spaces where they had no say. Everything was prearranged and fixed. I mean, she picked up on these things right away. And it was interesting. I had no idea that this would come anywhere close to them. Um, and she said, during the communist period, as much as people talked about it, women started to realize something of freedom and equality. Mm. That is to say, the communists made sure that the women had the same salaries as the men, mm. no matter how much the men barked about that. When women had the aptitude for being leaders, they were chosen as leaders. And that this set up a, a sort of imbalance. Now, she says, we're back into this position now. The, the communists are gone, but we're finding women being pushed back and back and back. All of the authority that they gained during the communist period is slowly withering away. And they're falling back into the traditional line. And then, she says, you look out on the street, and you see all of our young women who are grown up now with this idea from their mothers and their grandmothers of this sort of freedom. And you see, the only way that they can exhibit it is they've got their bodies. You see them in their tight black clothes. Uh, and, and they become objects now. And they are not developing into um, uh, you know, with a vision for carrying on the nation, they have now only themselves to project. I mean, it was it was interesting. I really wish I had all of that on 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 tape, and I'm saying it in my mind now, remembering her sitting there going through this, and other women there, recognizing the truth of what she was saying. There were some political types who said, oh, please, that's in-house. We don't want to talk about that. I mean, that was what they were saying with their body language. Um, but that was the most profound reaction, the most profound reaction, <laughs> in that this woman could take it, not only from the, the old period right into the new period, um, and say that what uh, struck her was that state of everything being prearranged. They were going back to that. And was beginning to see the great conflict, the rise of the church again, and the sort of block universe they were creating that once again would be male dominated. And, and, and. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I didn't know that it would have that kind. The, you know, that kind of response. Um, the one that I'd like to read now was uh, one that was in favor of the younger people in the audience. Uh, it's called Red Run, The Seventh Day. It's on page 29. And <clears throat> The uh, painting is uh, to the right on page 28. And again, the title is um, the title of the, the painting. Um, it took a long time for this point to work. And there's little doubt that each and every one of you knows the source of it. <clears throat> Red Run, the seventh day. Always I let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, believing his love sweeter than wine. The first tenderness is the lasting memory, ripe, rich fruit to squeeze over and over in dreams. That much I could hold on to between the seasons when he came to me and comforted me in the vineyards. And in the vineyards he did draw me unto himself 
and hold me about all my parts as measure of his love. And I took pleasure when his breath came short, came up short, and he thrashed me among the leaves of the vine. The grapes themselves being green and firm, giving off the smell of gentleness. And he in his fullness did close his limbs about me and did make me to run to my fullness at the gallop, at, at the slow gallop of Pharaoh's chariots. The seal upon my back is where it starts in spring when winter is past and the rains are gone. It rises as ridges of flesh fixed along the ribs and across the back, and in the season does bleed seven days, 30 days it takes to heal. All day for seven days I kneel. Before his likeness I kneel down each day until watchman names the cities from which I am banished, sick of love. Always I let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, believing his love sweeter than wine, remembering the first tenderness before this or that watchman comes calling names, bartering memories for the smokestacks at my back, gold rim goblets for the mirrors of my, in my palms, where the red ink of dreams runs like wild horses deep into the canyon of this body of a thousand years. Dear watchman, I say, I am already a thousand times dead and a thousand times awakened. Each day I bless my wounds that the knots of this life keep coming undone, that I do not yield my will to choose from the thousand cascading images the ones that make me crave pleasure into delirium, delirium, sleeplessness, a noose around my neck. Then I say good night and bed down to weep. All day for seven days I kneel, before his likeness I kneel down each day, all day. Night time comes and I rise, and I go along in dreams about the city, seeking to deliver my beloved to his mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me, alone, weeping. Always. I let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, believing his love sweeter than wine. The tenderness is a lasting memory, ripe, rich fruit to squeeze over and over in dreams. That much I could hold on to between the seasons when he came to me and comforted me in the vineyards. And in the vineyards he did draw me unto himself and hold me about all my parts as a measure of his love. And I shook with pleasure when his breath came up short, and he thrashed me, and then made me to turn my eyes away, for his eyes, for my eyes overwhelmed him, he said. And he could but moan and defy the names of threescore queens and fourscore concubines and virgins in waiting without names or number. My soul made me like the chariots of Anipabab. All day for seven long days I kneel. Before his likeness I kneel down the seventh day. It is spring, winter is past, the rain's gone. I who once looked forth as morning, fair as moons, as clear as a thousand suns, my good name and the attributes of my body, stoking all the world to boil. I kneel down, I am sick of love. Always I let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, believing his love sweeter than wine. The first tenderness is a lasting memory, rich fruit to squeeze over and over in dreams. That much I could hold on to between the seasons when he came to me and comforted me in the vineyards. 
On the seventh day, as I kneel, he comes, jovial and robust, having eaten honeycomb with his honey and drunk wine with his milk. It is just dark. My heart is awakened. To my door he comes and knocks. He has washed his feet and removed his clothes and says so in a voice sweeter than all he has consumed. I see his hand through the, through the hole near the lock. My bowels are moved for him. I rise and I open to my beloved, but he withdraws and disappears down some street with no name. I follow his scent of myrrh, trailing my scent of despair. Watchmen in the street find me. They smite and abuse me. The keepers of the gate, they strip away the veil from my body. I am naked and alone. The seal is upon my back. Oh, my sisters, my beloved is gone away down some no-name street. If you see my beloved before I do, tell him I said. Tell him the cunning artist who made me did not craft my soul of copper, that in time I may grow greenly youthful and firm as first fruit. Tell him, tell him, I say, I'm sick of love. <laughs>